I'm Russell Beard in Oahu, Hawaii, where coral conservation is going sub-zero. And I'm Rachel Mealy in Japan's Fukushima prefecture to visit the sun-free, soil-free farm of the future. And I'm Juliana Schatz in Peru to find out why an ancient system of stone canals built over a thousand years ago may help keep taps running in the country's capital, Lima. Peru's capital, Lima, is the second largest desert city in the world. Although the region enjoys a surplus of water during the rainy season, keeping it is a problem. Excess water is often lost to the ocean, leaving Lima's 9 million residents without a regular supply during the dry winter months. I'm Juliana Schatz in Peru to see how restoring a system of stone canals built in the Andes over a thousand years ago may help keep water flowing to the country's capital. In the next five to 20 years, if nothing is done, Lima will be on the brink of deep hydric stress. Its growing population and the effects of climate change mean that demand is outweighing supply. The shanty towns built on the periphery of Lima feel the effects of the water scarcity most severely. In theory, annual rainfall is sufficient to meet the demands of the water consumers in the city, but local groups are scrambling to find a way to ration this water. One of those groups is Condesan, who are using thousand-year-old technology to delay the flow of water at the source, high in the peaks of the Andes Mountains. Oscar from Condesan took us high up in the Andes to a little town called Huamantanga, where the ancient canals are being restored. Hola. ¿Cómo estás? This is Victor. He knows a ton about this area. He's from here. And he and his horses are going to take us all the way to the top to check out the canals. The ancient stone canals had largely been forgotten. But some years ago, the effects of climate change affected the rainy seasons, which turned shorter but more violent, creating a problem for Huamantanga's agriculture, the town's main source of income. And it was the oldest comuneros, or community members, who remembered how the canals worked. When we came here, we tried to solve their concern with these kind of canals. They knew these kind of systems it worked before. Yeah. And said, OK, let's restore let's it. This restored canal is being used as a pilot site to demonstrate the benefits of infiltration. During the rainy season, it captures large quantities of water from the rivers in the mountains. As the bottom of the canal is porous, the water filters directly into the ground and runs into springs and natural reservoirs further down the mountain, maintaining river flow during the dry season. In turn, the violent flows of water that occur after the rainy seasons will be reduced, and there will be less water wasted into the ocean. La gente antigua, los abuelos, nuestros ancestros, aprovechaban todos los recursos que teníamos. La sabiduría de los mamanteos, esos son los que nos han dejado hasta la actualidad. Condesan is continuing to test the effectiveness of these canals by injecting fluorescent dye into the canal's flow upstream to determine the place where this water will resurface. And this right here is what we call a ojo de agua, right? Exactly. It's like an eye of water okay. between different rocks, and it's where the water is going to resurface, it's going to reappear again. So what are we doing here right now? We set up this active uh, carbon, uh, this okay. active carbon has the property to absorb the fluorescent dye. What does the dye going through the carbon tell you? If we don't have any dye here, it means that canal doesn't fit this ojo de agua. And like this stream, like this ojo de agua, we set up like seven different active carbons in different parts of the, of the territory of Huamantanga. I've come to Huaraz to visit the Pastures Conservation Project which is another initiative aimed at controlling the flow of water to the lowlands more effectively. 
So I'm meeting juniors today here in Juarez. We're going up to the Highlands to check out some of the pastures they've been preserving over the last five years. Hola. We've come to meet Clemente, a farmer who has single-handedly transformed his immediate environment from barren, useless land to rich pastures which help regulate the flow of water into the ground. Buenos días, ¿cómo estás? Bien, bien, bien. Clemente. Clemente, yo soy Juliana. Todos estos pastos, ¿cuánto tiempo los has cuidado? 45 años tengo esto. Apenas. Apenas 45 años. Acá la semilla puedo sacar. Ajá, mostramos. Esta es la semilla. Este es el Tiene fruto adentro. ¿Y esto es lo que usas para sembrar más pasto? Sí, sí, sí. Acá hay fruto. Se ayuda el pasto, pues, Juliana. Filtra el agua y no corre corrientales. Acá adentro nomás su suelo ha entrado. El clima está cambiando porque está haciendo mucho calor y mucho frío para no aguantar. Antes no era así cuando era joven. Antes era hielo regular, pero ahora se ha bajado por mitad, más de mitad ya se ha ido. All of this land was barren before. These grasslands did not exist. This right here is really the fruit of his labor. Just have a look at this. I mean, look at how amazing this all looks now. And Junior has been monitoring the effects that Clemente's pastures have produced, measuring how much rainwater has been stored in the highland soils. Quiero mostrarte un pequeño ejemplo de cómo este, la lluvia que cae en, en los pastos filtra a través del suelo. Cuando no hay mucha lluvia, esta, eh, el agua que está saturado dentro del suelo comienza a salir poco a poco. Y eso hace que el caudal no disminuya, no desaparezca. Y la comunidad aguas abajo podría tener mayor cantidad de agua. Walking amongst the clouds, it seems to me the solutions to current environmental problems do not rest on expensive and modern technologies, but on the tried and tested methods of Peru's people. Returning to ancient techniques could help guarantee running water for millions of people living today. By 2050, the world will need to feed an additional two and a half billion people living in cities. Yet as the demand for food increases, the amount of space available for agriculture in developed countries is expected to fall. I'm Rachel Mealy in Japan's Fukushima prefecture to see how sun-free and soil-free urban farming could be the way of the future. We're here in the town of Aizu Wakamatsu at the Fujitsu plant. On this site, for more than three decades, the company has produced semiconductors for use in computers. But what we're here today is to see a new project Fujitsu is working on. Mr. Miyabi is going to show us. In recent years, the demand for the chips has slowed and the company has converted an unused part of the factory for its foray into agriculture. Please take off his shoes here. Okay, and... And the air 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 shower. Air shower. Yeah, air shower. Ooh, I wasn't expecting that. Particles yes. on my clothes. Okay. Yeah. So this project is called Kirei Yasai. What does that mean? Kirei means clean, and Yasai means vegetable. Right, the clean vegetable clean project. Clean vegetable project. We grow vegetables in a clean room that was uh, uh, used for semiconductor chips and. Uh, less particles and less bacteria. And it's soil free, is that right? Yes, yes, soil free. We, we don't need soil. Nutrient solution here in our In the tanks, tanks. right. And there is a pump and a nutrient solution uh, pumped up into a top tray like yes. this and closed under the vegetables and the second and the third, and return to the tank. To differentiate its lettuce from other farmers, Fujitsu has focused on growing a low potassium variety, which is sold to people with kidney problems who can't process the mineral properly. The lettuce is sold to nursing homes and hospitals in the area, as well as online for patients to buy directly. How many lettuce? 
lettuces are in there. Uh, 50,000 heads of lettuce here. 50,000, that's, that's a big salad. <laughs> Miyabe says a vegetable factory like this could be set up anywhere in the world, regardless of the climate. In the future, uh, this kind of plant factory will increase, not in Japan, but also all over the world. All of the cultivation condition is controlled, so through a year, uh, we, may, we can make uh, the same quality of the lettuce. You're producing a clean vegetable here, but we're not very far from the Fukushima nuclear power plant. Mm. Do you know that these vegetables don't have radiation? Our vegetables are safe, and also uh, we test the radiation twice a year. I'm now travelling to Kashua City, just outside Tokyo. It's an area of old-fashioned farms, but I'm here to visit another indoor farm using New Age methods. I'm meeting Shohei Yoshimoto from the Mirai Vegetable Company. Mirai is the Japanese word for future. Do you think that this is the future of, of farming? Sure. Uh, we believe this will be the solution for future food shortage problem. The Mirai company is not just in the lettuce business. It's also selling the systems for factory farming. And so far, they've had customers in Russia and Mongolia. Input costs such as power and labour are high. But because the farm can operate 24 hours a day, output is maximised. From seeding to harvesting, it takes 35 days. In open field, usually from 72 days to 90 days. So around 2.5 times faster. This factory produces about 10,000 lettuces a day and they're sold in supermarkets across Tokyo. Yoshimoto wants to show me a small-scale lettuce farm his company has sold to a restaurant just down the road from the factory. Yoshito, it doesn't get much fresher than that. So we visited the farm of the future. Perhaps in the restaurant of the future, a dish like this will come to the table where every component has been delivered fresh from the factory. are the most biologically diverse marine habitats in the world. Millions of people rely on them for food, as well as the reefs themselves affording vital protection against storm damage and coastal erosion. But years of unsustainable fishing practices and pollution and sea temperature rise means that up to a fifth of all coral reefs around the world have already been destroyed. I'm Russell Beard in Oahu, Hawaii, to meet a marine biologist who's working on a super cool solution to coral reef conservation. This is Coconut Island. Formerly a private party island for entertaining presidents and movie stars, it's since been colonized by a community of marine biologists. How are you? We're really excited about it. This could be a great day. And thanks to Dr. Mary Hagedun at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, it's now the world's center for cryogenic coral preservation. I, think I just saw a shark. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> what? Yeah, hammerhead. <laughs> hammerhead sharks. <laughs> oh, man. One of my major concerns about coral reefs is that we're having both warming and, and, and slow acidification of the ocean caused by overuse of fossil fuels. If we can take their sperm and ultimately their eggs and embryos, then we can form a frozen repository that will help us potentially reseed areas that are, are shrinking or ultimately keep it for hundreds of years and reseed the ocean. Hi guys, how are you doing? Today we're headed out to Turtle Rock to collect samples from the reef and learn more about these often misunderstood marine creatures. Coral, number one, are animals and they reproduce. Coral spawn once a year, generally, wow. and so they synchronize their spawning based on the moon and the sun. Uh, tomorrow and the next day will be this period that this coral spawn. 
we're, we're in very wavy, sort of um, fast-moving water. And um, that's perfect for the coral that we're going to collect today. It's called um, Pacillopora meandrina. It's pink and it's called commonly called the cauliflower coral because it looks just like a cauliflower. And you know those sharks that we saw back <laughs> at your... Um, is there a protocol for that kind of thing? Like, you did... Do what? Are there sharks here? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Mary and the team uh, just getting in the water just now. We're going to go and join them, get these samples, and get back to the lab. Known as rainforests of the sea, coral are commonly thought of as plants, but are in fact marine invertebrates that live in compact colonies and fix CO2 to create these characteristic skeletons. These cauliflower coral fragments will be housed temporarily at the lab and will be carefully reconnected to the reef in the coming months. Genetic diversity in a healthy reef allows species to adapt to changing environments, but the oceans are changing too quickly for corals to keep up. And in the last 30 years, half of the Australian Great Barrier Reef has been lost. I think so far in the future, you know, like 40 years from now, we may have nothing in the ocean. You know, it, it, you can't get to the point where everyone says, oh, you need to go out and cry or preserve these guys, because we only have two left. Yeah. You have to be yeah. working years ahead of the, the, the game. And so that's what, what we're doing here. If successful, Mary's gene bank will be a kind of frozen Noah's Ark that could theoretically be used tens, hundreds, or even thousands of years in the future. So all of our coral samples have been put to bed, ready for tomorrow morning when, fingers crossed, they'll be spawning. And I've come up to a different part of the university to meet a research professor called Ruth Gates. Now, she's looking at coral conservation from a completely different angle. Ruth heads up several research teams, one of which has been furthering our understanding of coral with the help of state-of-the-art time-lapse photography. I mean, I had been a oh, coral reef biologist for 25 years before I saw these images for the first time, and, and frankly, I had no idea it was going to look like this. Here we have the laser scanning confocal microscope. So basically, it creates high resolution fluorescent images. You see corals in the ocean, and they look like a rock. Right. And then you bring them on here, and there's so much color and vibrancy and life. And that was one of the most shocking things I saw initially, seeing how they are an animal and they're alive. These alien-looking creatures are, in fact, the mouths of the coral polyps. The individual red dots are photosynthetic algae that live in the coral and pay for their keep in the form of sugars that the coral need to grow. This symbiotic relationship is a fragile one, with sea temperature rise, the coral evict their algae, causing them to turn white and slowly die of starvation. This is known as bleaching. In 1998, a global bleaching event killed 16% of the world's coral reefs, and there are predictions that this year, another global bleaching event is on the way. Corals are dying at a rate that is exceeding their ability to adapt, and that is a fact. They are the canary in the coal mine for climate change. But actually, when we go out on a reef, we realize there are individual corals mm. that are seemingly able to withstand conditions that kill their neighbors. Mm. And if we can understand the mechanisms that underpin survival, we're taking it one step further and asking whether we could harness that knowledge mm. to actually breed corals that are now preconditioned to future ocean conditions. So these are real corals in here, but these tanks we can control for temperature and for pH. This is essentially like a coral gym. That's a coral gym, exactly. Yeah, it's they're a treadmill. working out right now. Well, they, they're working out, we've got the temperature slightly higher than they would normally see in nature, and the, the chemistry is slightly depressed, that is, it's slightly more acidic, which is really recreating conditions that are predicted for 2050. So the thing that, that, that we're trying to do is really to assist evolution. It's early stages, but Ruth's aim is to breed coral that shows signs of resilience and may one day lead to a new generation of hardy offspring 
which could form the basis of super resilient reefs of the future. So it's pretty early, the sun has just risen and we've come down to meet Mary and the team. We're going to be working on those coral samples we picked up from the sea floor yesterday. And we're hoping that within the next hour or so, those corals are going to spawn. We'll be able to collect that genetic information and send it up to the lab to be frozen. He looks amazing, doesn't he? Yeah. I say he, but it's not. They're not really a he or a she, they're are they? He and she's, they're right? he's and she's. They're hermaphrodites. They're hermaphrodites. Wow. Very exciting. Can I add him to the pack? And uh, then it's just a bit of a waiting game. If it doesn't happen today, the team might have to wait another year for the next chance. I'm hoping that we, we will get something, because um, I, you know, that this would then that now be five years that we're waiting for this coral. The cauliflower coral is particularly important. It's native to the region, and as a pioneer species, in the event of a collapse, it's the most likely to succeed in establishing a new reef. Any luck so far? Uh oh. <sighs> Come on, guys. And then, just before we gave up. I think this one's spawning, Jenny. It looks pretty dense, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's all kicking off now. How many have spawned? I think there's like at least five or six spawning all at the same time. So I think it's kind of all hands to the pump. We have just minutes to collect the sperm before the eggs arrive. Okay, put it, like, in there. it looks like a pinch of cinnamon. I, it's water. exactly right, they're so tiny. After carefully cleaning the eggs to avoid cell fertilization, the samples are rushed up to the lab for freezing. This technique, known as vitrification, has been used in human fertility treatments since the mid 1980s, but Mary and her colleagues were the first on the planet to use it for coral. And if the kit looks a bit homemade, that's because it is. When it comes to best practice for cryogenic coral preservation, these pioneers are literally writing the book. But minus 25 degrees, just about. So we have to get it down to minus 80. At minus 80, the vials can be fully submerged in the liquid nitrogen, taking them down to a temperature of minus 196 degrees Celsius, where chemical activity within the cell is effectively stopped theoretically preserving the integrity of the cells indefinitely. But freezing the samples is only half the battle. So right now we're going to pull one of our samples out. We're going to thaw it, just like it would happen in the future. If they can bring the sperm back to life, it will be proof that the team have successfully nailed the process for this species and the rest of the samples can be banked for the future. So this is what I was wanting to see. That's a lot of movement. Let's see. Oh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. 40 years from now, they may be using these banks in a, in a way we never imagined. By freezing these cells, the whole DNA is there. So it's the most important book of life that we can be doing. And right now we have about 11, 12 now, <laughs> hopefully, species of coral that we've cryopreserved in the world. And trillions of cells that are frozen at this point. These samples, together with the processes that they're proving possible, will provide the fertile foundations for a growing global network of biologists to join the fight and preserve our planet's marine biodiversity. Being here has made it clear that climate change isn't something to prepare for in the future. It's something that's happening right now. <laughs>